going to take the prayer from Psalm 119. I deeply love your law. I think about it all day. Your laws never leave my mind, and they make me much wiser than my enemies. Thinking about your teachings gives me better understanding than my teachers. And obeying your laws makes me wiser than those who have lived a long time. I obey your word instead of following a way that leads to trouble. You have been my teacher, and I won't reject your instructions. Your teachings are sweeter than honey. They give me understanding and make me hate all lies. Your word is a lamp that gives light wherever I walk. Your laws are fair and I have given my word to respect them all. I never forget your teachings, although my life is always in danger. Lord, help me. Help me to understand your teachings. Help us this morning, Lord, to understand what it is about your word that makes it so wonderful. In the name of Jesus, amen. Well, apparently um, I have proof now, physical proof, that it's okay for me to stand here and teach like this. You saw it earlier. I'm joking, of course. So at one point, one of the party were with us yesterday said, don't get used to wearing the gown round at church. And I said, oh, take me back to my Superman days, that did. Anyway, Bible Sunday. Uh, today's the day. It's interesting, actually. Today, that psalm I wasn't going to read. But funny enough, in one of the uh, Word Live emails I get from Scripture Union, that was today's Scripture Bible reading, was about meditating on the law of the Lord, actually treating the word of the Lord and understanding it is sweeter than honey. So I thought that was quite relevant for today, and I thought, oh, we'll use that today. Now, you may not like honey particularly, so I prefer to think of it like strawberry jam. Good quality strawberry jam, you know? Sweet on the taste of the mouth. Now, as Christians, we should all sit here and say, Yes, I believe in the Bible. Yes, it's something I should meditate on day and night. It is something that I should read every day at least. Something I should be excited about picking up and reading. That's meant to be our, what we're meant to believe, isn't it? Okay. But if we're also deeply honest, there are times that it just feels like See, thank you, there's some honesty. So, we're going to go through the Bible today. It's not going to be some deep, deep, deep teaching. Um, You may have a theology degree now, it does not mean that I always want to go that deep. But I think it would be interesting to, 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 for us to maybe be refreshed. We may have been very long, not very long-term Christians, and we need to understand something about the Bible. You may be very long-term, mature Christians, and sometimes you've lost that excitement of what the Bible is about. The literature we have at the back on the left that uh, is going to be available again after this is to help you, inspire you to want to read the word of the Lord, to inspire you to get excited about delving into it. It's not just Bibles there, there's Bible reading notes, but there's also some other deeper books in there like uh, Tom Wright, for instance, help you to get into deeper understanding of some of the books, like maybe the Gospels, because surface reading is all well and good, but sometimes there's a much richer Deeper meaning. It's like the strawberry jam. You know, you you can take a a thin sliver of the pureed version of it, but actually there are pips sometimes inside that just give an extra flavor to the jam. That's what you do when you get deeper into the Bible. It can give you some extra depth of flavor as you understand it more. But I'm going to quote some people, not Bible, some people to you. This is a quote. See if you can figure out who said this. You Christians look after a document containing enough dynamite to blow all civilization to pieces. Turn the world upside down and bring peace to a battle-torn planet. But you treat it 
as though it was nothing more than a piece of literature. Anybody like to shot in the dark who that might have been? It's historical figures. Gandhi. Here's another one for you. The Bible is no mere book, but a living creature with a power that conquers all that oppose it. Napoleon Bonaparte. And this one gets me. I'll tell you this in advance because it might get you to understand something. This is uh, Horace Greeley, who was a 19th century American newspaper editor. It is impossible to enslave mentally or socially a Bible reading people. The principles of the Bible are the groundwork of human freedom. I want to say that again. Note this is a newspaper editor. Given what's been happening recently in our news and about phone hacking and how the press change our thinking, listen to this. It is impossible to enslave mentally or socially a Bible-reading people. If you capture that essence and then relate that to our life today with the way that the newspapers make us think about situations and politicians and, 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 and maybe make us think about human trafficking and almost sort of dampen it down or make, try and make us think that poverty in this country and is not as bad as it makes out or, or those that are actually on benefits are just work sponges and work shy people, which is what our press would like us to believe. When you read the Bible you actually are not enslaved to their opinions. When you look at advertising, when you look at everything around you, the TV, the media, the billboards, you're not enslaved by their messages. That was a newspaper editor. It is impossible to enslave mentally or socially a Bible-reading people. And this next quote now is Anon. Many Christians, who's a Christian here? Would you like to, yeah, ready for this? Expect the world to respect a book that they themselves neglect. Would you like me to say that again? Many Christians expect the world to respect a book that they themselves neglect. At which point, I reckon you with me will always go, there has been times I have neglected the word of God. It has been an excellent dust collector rather than a cobweb away blower. When I became a Christian over 20 years ago, as my baptism present, my mum bought me a Bible. Beautiful it was, red, New King James Version, fantastic, gold leaf edging around it, absolutely stunning. Bought it in Perivale Christian Bookshop, funny enough, not advertising them specifically, but that's where we got it from. Remember the moment so well. Even bought fantastic cover. One of those big 90s covers that go round them. I think people still have them sometimes. I thought, oh, this is fantastic. It, you know, it looked fantastic for a few years just sitting on my bedside. It got no creases in it at all. Got no creases because it just got never opened. It looked good. I as my early days as a Christian, didn't realize it was something you are meant to read. You're meant to go beyond Genesis chapter one, verse one. <laughs> and my baptism, I somebody, I remember this, uh, come up and thrust into me how to memorize Bible verses and all of that. I thought, gosh, this is amazing. But it looks so pretty in a box. You laugh, and I admit to my folly as a young, fledgling Christian, not understanding what to do. 20 years on, you realize, actually, it is the primary place we Christians need to give to. It is the primary place we are to run to when we are not sure. It is the primary place that we should have open and I am not saying over the last 20 years, I do it every day. I am not saying over the last 20 years, I am perfect and got it pinned down. 
But if this quote is correct, that we Christians expect people to respect that book, yet we neglect it. Interesting. For me, the more freedom speech in that was that newspaper editor. That actually, it is impossible. It's not just vaguely. It's impossible to mentally or socially enslave us. If you're a Bible reading people. So far excited about it? Because if it's that freeing, why does the remote controls to the TV get placed on top of it? Well, so the Bible, it's made up of how many books? Does anybody know? Thank you, 66. And now can you split it between the Old Testament and the New Testament? Well done. It's the other way around. But you're right, though. Got it correct. It's 39 in the Old, 27 in the New. But if you look in the Hebrew version of the Old Testament, it's a lot shorter. We split up some of the books, like 1 and 2 Chronicles and 1 and 2 Kings and all that. We've actually split those up. But I just thought, just a bit of fun. But do you know something about the Bible? It didn't just suddenly land overnight one night and went, Dudum, here you go. An angel didn't come down and go, there's the Bible. It's all sewn up for you. The anglicized version, there you go. It's all beautifully done. It actually, what we have now here within the Protestant Church, which is this version, because there is the Catholic version which has extra books in it, the Apocrypha it's known as. Um, if you want to discuss that, what that is later, I will do later on. But um, what we have now came together in 400 AD or thereabouts, about 397 uh, AD in reality. What we have now took that long to actually what we have today. And what makes me laugh about that is not one person came up with the Bible. It spread over many, many centuries, ultimately. The Old Testament, what we have now, got finalized in the first century. What we now accept as the Old Testament in, in Christian scriptures got sewn up in the first century. But the New Testament, the letters and the Gospels, that took nearly another 400 years to come together as we have today. Not that the letters got written over 400 years, they all got written in the first century AD. But actually for the church collectively to come together prayerfully and to agree what is, what is actually from God and what is actually human makeup, this is what we have today. Now I'm excited about that. On one level, we don't like that idea. Sometimes we think, so you just mean that just people took years to decide what wasn't. They didn't get instant spirit inspiration from God then. What unfortunately happened over a few centuries that people were trying to be helpful in coming up with gospel stories about Jesus that weren't strictly true, well, weren't true at all, really. And so you needed to find out which was real and which wasn't. It took a collection of church leaders to eventually come up with the list that they have. What happened was, over those years, various church leaders dotted around the world decided to start generating their own list through their own study. And eventually, what they noted, without really discussion with each other, that they came up with exactly the same listing for the New Testament. Which is interesting, isn't it? But I would like to tell you about somebody who, back in 144 AD, Marcion, who made us laugh, he was anti-Jewish. So there was no Old Testament. He would have only allowed the Gospel of Luke in, and even that was the edited version, any Jewish reference taken out. There would have been none of the pastoral letters. Revelation wasn't allowed in. Hebrews weren't allowed in. Only some of the, Paul's from, the letters from Paul he would have allowed in, into the Bible. At which point you're going to say, but the Apostle Paul was Jewish, Warren. Yeah, but apparently, according to Marcin, because he was Greek, he was okay. Anyway, I'm glad to say everybody ignored Marcion and said he was actually being a heretic. Go away. But we now have what we've got today. Now, what's the point of saying all that? Well, if you can turn with me, please, to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. 
Because for me, this is important. Two Timothy, chapter three, verse sixteen and seventeen. If you have a Move Church Bible, it's in page one one nine seven. If you have your various phone apps, search away. 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17. Pastor David made reference to this uh, last week, that he would expect me to preach, or at least mention it in passing, and I am doing so. It reads, all scripture, scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. I'll repeat that again. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God, and by the way, and woman of God, it's the NIV's version, may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, Paul wrote that to Timothy. And when he talked about scripture being God-breathed, he specifically, at this point, would have been talking about the Old Testament, the Torah, the Jewish, Jewish writings, because really that's all they had at this point. They didn't have the Gospels as such written down, and they didn't have these pastoral letters collated. These are letters they were sending. It's only subsequent we as church have pulled them together and realized these are actually God-breathed scripture. What does God-breathed mean? It means god breathed inspiration into the writers of the various scriptures. It was not that God breathed and the words formed on a page all by themselves. There was a human hand involved in writing the scriptures. God works with his creation. That's what God breathed means. It is God inspiring through his spirit the scriptures to be written as they are. What interests me is this. If you go through each 66 books of the Bible, you will see if you're able to do it and really read them, and sometimes it's a bit difficult now in our very nice sanitized English versions, but you will note in each of the things there is a different tone sometimes to the writing. Words are slightly different. Not each book has exactly the same tone and language and way of being written. Do you understand what I mean by language? Uh, you know, in this country, for instance, in, in, in England, we all, uh, you know, the primary language is meant to be English, yes? English-speaking country. Yet, you will note, if I'm speaking English, and maybe somebody from up north is speaking English, we're speaking the same language, but our tone, I'm not talking about just the accent, but some of the words that might be used might be slightly different. Do, do you know what I mean? And I wish I could think of an example right now, but it's really not helpful at the moment. But there'll be certain things that just slightly got a different tone. They may not say the same word exactly the same. They might shorten it or lengthen it. It's like Andy was talking about Timmy learning Cockney while he was in Cyprus. Cockney is English, but it has a different tone. It has a rhyming, like my old China plate. Going down a frog and toad. I take it you learned all of those. Me Plates of meat, Timmy. Not meat on plate. Plates of meat. Meaning your feet, mate. Goodness me. You didn't teach him very well, did you? Unbelievable. Unreal. But do you see what I mean? It's English, but it's a different tone. The Bible's got the same sort of thing. It hasn't got cockney in it. I hasten to add. But it's got the same thing. It's different tones, different ways of doing the language. And it's over many, many centuries, which is also interesting. So therefore, some of the meaning of the words have changed slightly, ever so slightly, but have changed. I mean, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, and the New Testament, as far as we can, are mainly what we have now is in Greek. But it's different styles of language. Apparently now, if I speak to somebody from West London from 200 years ago, right? Not that sort of West London, but they wouldn't actually understand me half the things I'm saying. 
which point you're probably all saying, well, we don't understand you now. But, but the point is, they wouldn't understand. Even though we might use the same word, it actually has a different meaning. Hmm? Yeah, wicked. I mean, these days, wicked, even though it really does mean evil and cruel and whatever else, but in another tang, thank you, Andy, it actually means wicked. It's good, isn't it? Sick, yeah, apparently so, yeah. Yeah, yeah we'll move on from that one. I think there are some things that are just not good. I must admit, I am noting, as, uh, as my daughter is getting older, I am having to learn a new language. Other than the dictionary. No. I thought learning Greek was hard enough. Boy, nothing compared to l using the youth language. What? Anyway. But it's got different tones. So actually what I find amazing about that is this God breathed is God doesn't bypass the personality of the person writing. He uses the time and the culture and the language that is relevant at that time. And that's what we have in scripture. That also means for me, when we go back to Pentecost and Acts 2, and that whole different languages and different tongues being spoken, God says, I crossed all barriers. And he does that even in his Bible, in his word. Yet we miss that sometimes. There is an excellent Bible now out that's called The Voice. It's the one that, you know, I got given my ordination. And they've tried to do that. They've tried to, each letter, even though it's in English, give a different tone to it to try and point out to you the different tones of language and accent that is being used. I find it fascinating that when you read this, you are reading the hand of a human, but you are reading the mind of God through that hand, but also the mind of the person writing in their own culture. That's God breathed. And so when hearing Paul says that the Old Testament scriptures are God-breathed, we now say today, but the New Testament scriptures are also God-breathed. Why? Because multiple people, multiple church leaders have come together and said and agreed that these are the scriptures of our Lord. These are God's words on paper. Therefore, then, they need to be put with the because Jesus is carrying on the story, they need to be put with the Old Testament and be counted as God breathed. And because it was the church at the time that hopefully prayerfully and also came together, if you want to read the history, it's amazing, fascinating history of how they did it. They said, this is authoritative now. It's what we call the canon, nice word. But this is authoritative. These are the authoritative words of God that are God breathed. And this is what we have here. Yet, many Christians expect the world to respect a book that they themselves neglect. If this Bible is authoritative, i.e. it's God speaking through his word, it's God's authority speaking through his word, we should take note and get more excited about reading it every day. Yes? So let's just look at this quickly, this 2 Timothy passage. Let's just break down the various things that Paul says about Scripture. Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching. Teaching literally does mean the imparting of information and instruction. Doesn't mean much more than that. That means quite a lot when you read it. It gives you information and it gives you instruction. If you're a teacher here, when you say things, who's a teacher? Raise your hands. Try and not be modest about it. Raise your hands. If you're a teacher, you expect your pupils to listen to your instruction, don't you? I know the lecturers expected me to actually understand what they were saying and to listen and to take it on board. Well, if this is according to Paul, teaching then we need to listen to it. Rebuking. The Greek word for rebuking here only occurs once throughout the whole of the Bible. And it's here. It's warnings. It means warnings based on the word. Saying actually this is useful for giving warnings to people and they have to be issued from the word, from scripture. And actually, false teachers 
must be exposed with Scripture. That's what he's getting at when he's saying about rebuking here. That false teachers must be, not just will be, but must be exposed using Scripture. That's what the word is getting at. So if there's ever a false teacher, somebody who's expounding something about God or Jesus that is not helpful, you have to use Scripture to actually rebuke them. And do it properly. I emphasize that. I have heard scripture be really misused. And it's that person using it to gain their own, uh, 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 well, for gain, for self-gain. To actually underpin and prove something that they believe is right and actually it's wrong. They are misusing scripture. The Bible's been misused all its life. So it must be used correctly to rebuke a false teacher. It says here, correction. Once again, it's only once that that word here, correction, is used, or for correcting. Now, the underlying meaning for that is actually, it's about reformation. It means actually about improvement. It's not just about correcting someone, but it's about improving them or bringing reformation into their way of thinking. Is it not Paul that says in Romans, be transformed by the renewing of your mind? That's done through scripture, through reading scripture, through reading this word. And as that great American newspaper editor says, it is impossible to enslave mentally or socially a Bible reading people. This is it. Your mind is reformed as you reform it to the word of God. Your thinking is corrected. If you think you're right about something, you've imposed a way of living that you think is correct. When you come to scripture and you realize it's not a way, then your mind is reformed. You go, oh, I got that wrong. And then you are improved. Training. It's useful for training. This is very true. After six years of it, I can assure you it's very useful for training. But the word here is about actually training children. It's like training children. It's instruction to help somebody be nurtured and to grow, to mature in Christ. That's what it's useful for, is to help you grow. You don't just grow on the spirit, I'm sorry. A plant, so I've discovered recently, can't grow just on water. It does require some good old solid earth. We don't just grow on the Holy Spirit. We need to grow in the word of God as well. So we have to take the word of God and actually read it and study it. I've discovered you drown plants quite easily if you overwater them. I now have a plant in my office. Joy is currently teaching me how to care for it properly. I have a history of killing plants. Not just the McNeil ones, neither. I've killed somebody else's plant recently who they asked me to look after it. You can ask me later because I overwatered it. I don't think it's true, actually. Funny, if you can be overwatered with the Holy Spirit to the point where you think you're doing all right, actually, there's no earth foundation in you. So you're easily toppled over or washed away. But the Word of God keeps us grounded, it keeps us real, it keeps us growing. Righteousness, this is an obvious one. It's about right living, God living. Scripture is helping us be righteous, help us to live for God and live godly lives. And it also says here that it is actually thoroughly useful in verse 17, so that the person of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. She's saying that scripture is entirely complete. 
It is ready to equip you to do good work. Now, there is some thinking that it's only the Bible ever that Christians must read or look at or watch or whatever, ever. Stay focused on the Bible. Don't look at anything else. Don't watch TV. Don't go to the cinema. Don't read any other books. That is not what it is saying. Because you need to understand the world around you to understand what the Bible is saying. Sorry, I'll make a joke about this. The lecturer yesterday who spoke up and gave us the sermon at our graduation yesterday, he got thunder in the middle of his sermon as he was talking. God gave him authoritative voice. I get a car alarm. (laughs) Thank you. You know when you get those moments, you think, there's a car alarm going off. He got thunder yesterday, but it was an excellent sermon, I've got to say. It was exciting. even made all the children brilliant. Anyway... So scripture is here and it's thoroughly suitable to help us all reach the fullness of Christ. To become fully mature in Jesus. And it's something we need to take on board. Something else we need to take on board. is to note that Jesus actually learned the Old Testament scriptures. Jesus where it says in Luke chapter 2, verses 40 and 52, he grew in wisdom and stature. That happened also because he studied the scriptures. If you remember maybe my sermon at the beginning of the year over the Christmas time, we looked at the fact that Jesus had to grow, means he had to learn the scriptures. Jesus didn't just get it by osmosis. He didn't just know it instantly. And do you know something? He didn't know the New Testament neither, because it hadn't been written by the time he ascended into heaven. Oh, he was the author through people, but it hadn't got written. So even he had to study the Old Testament. We need to do the same if we want to grow in wisdom and stature. It's not a boring book. It really isn't. Even numbers is exciting. Even the genealogies are exciting. Because it's a long ancestral history of people that we are connected with. And I try and convince myself of that at times when I go to read it. I go, let's skip over the son of Omri and the son of this and the son of that. Oh, that's okay. Let's skip about three pages. We'll be fine. We don't need to read. But actually, sometimes when you read it, you pick up something. The Spirit speaks through you and through that word. As Bonaparte said, it's a living creature because the Holy Spirit makes it alive as we read it. So do you know there's some really juicy bits in the Bible? So we're going to look at them, because I want us to get excited. You excited? There are some really juicy bits in the Bible, even Ecclesiastes. Now I say this, right, because when Pastor David last week mentioned the fact that he was going to get into one of the most exciting bits of the Bible, and then literally, as he said, Ecclesiastes, I was sat there, and I watched some faces go, oh, you all revved up. And then he went Ecclesiastes, and I saw some distinct disappointment looks. Ecclesiastes is fun. I'm not looking at anyone, but I did mark your name down. No, I'm joking. (laughs) So, turn with me. There's science fiction action in the Bible. Turn with me to 2 Kings, chapter 6. We're going to make this quick. We're going to flick around. So if you can get to it quick, great. If you can't, just listen to me reading, and that's absolutely fine. And I have labelled every book we're looking at, so I don't have a Joel moment. 2 Kings 6, 15 to 17. When the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, O oh Lord, open the, his eyes so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked, and he saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all round Elisha. 
Now, allow, do you know something about the word of God that's amazing? You can allow your imagination as you read it to wonder. You're allowed to allow your imagination to be there. So imagine you're that shaking servant and you see this army that's descended on you. You're panicking. You talk to the prophet Elijah, your master, and say, what are we going to do? They're going to kill us all. And he says, ah, don't worry about it. We got a bigger army with us. Lord, open his eyes. And then you don't just see the army. You see the army of the Lord. You see chariots of fire. You see horses ablaze that suddenly come into view. Imagine watching a movie with that happening. No, no, I'm just saying, just imagine the context of that happening. We'll all be sitting again. I want to see that in 3D. Yeah? Well, it's there in 3D, in the Bible and in your imagination, because it happened for real. You can read that getting excited. There's rock music in the Bible. There really is. That might put some people off. If you can turn to Psalm 150, please. Psalm 50 says, praise the Lord, praise God in his sanctuary, praise him in the heaven, mighty heavens, praise him for his acts of power, praise him for his surpassing greatness, praise him with the sounding of the trumpet, doesn't sound very rock music yet, praise him with the harp and lyre, most certainly doesn't yet, praise him with the tambourine and dancing, most certainly doesn't sound rock music, praise him with strings and flutes, praise him with a clash of cymbals, praise him with resounding cymbals, notice cymbals is there. Thank you very much, Allah. Notice cymbals are in there twice. Rock music. I'm sure a snare drum will be in there, way, eh, Andy? Yeah. But get excited. Because when you read the word of the Lord, you notice it spans everywhere. There is excitement in it. Did you know that Shrek was in the Bible? Shrek's in the Bible. Turn with me to Numbers. Chapter 22. Shrek is in here. Well, at least one of his companions. Then the angel of the Lord moved on ahead and stood in a narrow place where there was no room to turn, either to the right or to the left. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, he, she lay down under Balaam, and he was angry and beat her with his staff. Then the Lord opened the donkey's mouth and said to Balaam, what have I done to you to make you beat me these three times? I'm not going to try and do an Eddie Murphy impression. Balaam answered the donkey, you have made a fool of me. If I had a sword in my hand, I would kill you right now. The donkey said, am I not your own donkey, which you have always ridden to this day? Have I been in the habit of doing this to you? Probably not even been in the habit of talking to him neither. No, he said. Then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with his drawn sword. There is a talking donkey in the Bible. Shrek. No, no, I said, or he's one of his companions. But imagine yourself in a movie. The point is, I'm trying to get you to actually understand that actually there is just, as I talked about different tones in the Bible, there's just amazing things that God does in the Bible. God talks through animals. I know that sounds really weird. And maybe into our very sensible society, we think that's never going to happen again. I swear blind, my cat talks to me. It may not be God talking, but I swear my cat does. Do you know, he does. Have I said this before? I've said this. Oh, no, I know where I said this. I'll tell you. This. I kid you not. Toffee walks in. He has a particular chair. Okay? He walks into the room. Now, if my jumper is on that chair, he will look at me and meow. And this is no word of a lie. Joy will vouch for this. He will meow. I have to get up, move my jumper. He then gives me another type of tone of squeak and then leaps onto the chair and then settles down. But unless I move that jumper, he won't move. He knows his stuff. I don't think it's God talking, but you get the point. But the Bible is exciting. Yes? There is romance. There's Mills and Boone in the Bible. Turn with me to Song of Songs. Chapter 5. Verses 10 to 16. 
There is eloquent, romantic language in the Bible. There is beautiful description in here. Now, if any of those that may be, and if you're willing to admit to this, have had read Fifty Shades of Grey, I've never read it, I can only go by the reviews, but you might find some bounce in here. This is the lady talking about her man. My lover is radiant and ruddy, outstanding among 10,000. His head is purest gold. His hair is wavy and black as a raven. His eyes are like doves by the water streams, washed in milk, mounted with jewels. His cheeks are like beds of spice, yielding perfume. His lips are like lilies, dripping with myrrh. His arms are rods of gold, set with chrysolite. His body is like polished ivory, decorated with sapphires. His legs are pillars of marble, set on bases of pure gold. His appearance is like Lebanon, choice as its cedars. His mouth is sweetness itself. He is altogether lovely. He is my lover, this my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. Now, if you can't get excited by that language, I mean, Joyce says that to me every morning, but if you can't... Oh, no, it's not. Are you getting up and you're going swimming? That's what it is. But do you understand? I know when we do marriage preparation with people, who go, oh, didn't realise that was in the Bible. It's so beautiful. And to balance it out, because one should, here is what the man says about his... They call it beloved in lover. They are betrothed to be married. And you can see that they're eventually going to be married. So this is in the context of marriage. I shall read this to you. Ladies, would you like some of your men to say this to you? How beautiful your sandaled feet, O prince's daughter. Your graceful legs are like jewels, the work of a craftsman's hands. Your navel is a rounded goblet that never lacks blended wine. Your waist is a mound of wheat encircled by lilies. Your breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle. <laughs> Stay with this. Seriously, listen to the beautiful language. I know it's easy to laugh at, but listen to the language. Your neck is like an ivory tower. Your eyes are the pools of Heshbon by the gate of Bath Ribbon. You figure out what he means by that. Your nose is like the Tower of Lebanon looking towards Damascus. No, he's not talking about a big nose. <laughs> Your head crowns you like Mount Carmel. Your hair is like royal tapestry. The king is held captive by its tresses. How beautiful you are and how pleasing, O love, with your delights. Then it goes on and on. It's actually quite a lot of thing in there. Now, the point is, read that language. There's something about that in the Bible that's exciting. It is romantic. We, uh, it's part of the thing. When you do marriage preparation with couples, you actually encourage them to read that to each other because it is beautiful. In the context of a marital relationship, there is nothing wrong in talking about the physique of the man and f- talking about the physique of the woman and what you appreciate in that context. Today, we've sort of almost turned the conversation of talking about uh, the physique of either side, almost pornographic. But it's in the Bible here, talking about it as the beauty that it is, that God formed these bodies in whichever way they look. Get excited when you read it in the word of the Lord. God hasn't got a problem in talking about breasts. Whether you like it or not, he hasn't. Because he formed them and he made them. Doesn't mind talking about six packs or just how a man looks. Whether he's like me. (laughs) Got a good barrel. (laughs) If I've always said I've got a six pack, it's all just wrapped up in one package. (laughs) (sighs) But, But the Bible is exciting. It has romance in it. It has beautiful language about us. It has a different tone to it. It also has duh moments. That's a bit logical, isn't it? Turn with me to Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 8. Verse 23 says this. And this is God speaking. 
Oh, sorry, this is wisdom speaking, I apologise. The Lord brought me forth at the first of his works before his deeds of old. I was appointed from eternity, from the beginning, before the world began. And we'd go, but that's wisdom. Duh, that's logical. But it also says this, it has real things to say in the Bible. For Proverbs 12, verse 1. Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but he who hates correction is stupid. Real life. I bet that's been sanitized as well. But it's real life. If you love, not, if you love discipline, you love knowledge. Any teacher in the house will go, yes, agree with that. But he who hates correction is stupid. Logical, but great words. Words that help us walk in our life to understand this. And other words as well. Reckless words pierce like a sword but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Many of us, including myself, need to learn to control this small rudder. There it is in the word of the Lord, though, that says that. We take that on board, we will run with that. If we meditate on those words, we will learn to control our tongue. And just when we speak, we bring healing into people's lives. Words are powerful. If it was the word of the Lord that brought all of creation into being, there's something about words that are powerful, and it says so in his own word. And there's bedtime stories as well in the Bible. Turn with me to Luke chapter 15, verses 8 to 10. You can read this bedtime story and imagine yourself being one of these. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Does she not light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of angels of God over one sinner who repents. Why is that a good bedtime story? It's another one of those that you can tell to children, you can tell to yourselves and imagine yourself sweeping the house. You can get wrapped up in the imagination of it all. Kids will understand that language. You can even hide a coin in the house and make them go and search for it and use it as a good story to help them in understanding about rejoicing and how much God loves them. The Bible is not boring. And I haven't got time to mention all the works of the Spirit. I haven't got time to mention demon possession, sins washed away, ethical and moral and life-giving teaching. We have everyday characters in the Bible who are turned into faith heroes. Because they knew their scriptures. Oh yeah, and there's a man in there called Jesus who ended up being our God and our saviour. How can you not get excited about reading this book? I hope you're somewhat excited about maybe trying to reread it again. Some of us stick to the New Testament and Psalms. That makes you an excellent evangelical. But if you want to look further, look in more into the Old Testament and what's there. There's more about what God has got to say about how he deals with his people in the Old Testament as well. And it relates to us today. Just because Jesus came and changed the covenant doesn't change the way that God deals with his people. It never did. So there's things in there. The Holy Spirit's in the Old Testament just as much as he's in the New, by the way. The way to read the Bible? Well, personal devotion time. There's multiple ways of doing that. Some people like to have books uh, which give you a day-by-day basis of what to read, yeah? Yeah. Who does that? Does anybody do that? Have like sort of our daily bread and UCB and things like that. You have some free UCBs at the back there that you're willing to take away if you wish. But having that personal devotion time between you and God as you read the word and ask him to open the scriptures to you using the, uh, your daily Bible reading notes, that's fantastic. 
There's some of us, maybe like me, who actually now have emailed to me my daily Bible by Word Life Scripture, which is by the Scripture Union. And anybody that's met with me not long after being baptized, it's something that I encourage you to do. Because you could then get a daily reminding text. Read this. It's easy to ignore it. The Holy Spirit has this habit of prodding. <laughs> and it's fun. And I count, lost count of the amount of times that people have come up to me and said, on this day, I was having a really rough time. Or I really needed to hear from God on something. And what came through was in that scripture reading for that day. Like for today for me. Nu was going to talk about this. And what's today's reading? It's about reading the word of God. Psalm 119. Also, the other way that's really important about studying and reading scripture is you can go deeper than just reading it. As I said, there are books at the back to help you even understand what you're reading even deeper. But also being part of a group of people, either a Bible study group like John's or, or Jim, or, and I know I'm going to forget people and I apologize, but any Bible study group, Coming together, reading the word together collectively to help interpret it. That's well worth it. And also read it with somebody you're going to disagree with. It's good. Because you get better ideas off of people. I love negotiating it with people I really, really disagree with. But it's great. Because you learn from each other. And sometimes you learn you were wrong in the first place. And also, I think sometimes if you read it alone for too long, it's very easy to get locked in your mindset that you believe you are right about something in Scripture that justifies something, an attitude you've got, and actually it turns out you're wrong when you start discussing it with others and you realize you needed your mind opening. It's good to read it with others. Please hear me carefully. It's really good to make sure you bounce it around with others. So read the word of the Lord every day if you can. Even if it is a verse, but I encourage you to read it throughout the whole year. Most Christians by now, if you've been a Christian for more than three years, I reckon you should have at least read the whole of the Bible at least once. Don't miss bits out of it. Even the boring bits. Because there's always something exciting in them. Very quickly, I remember a testimony of a guy once who actually did say that he really needed to hear from God. He was feeling very dejected, very lonely, very whatever else, and he really needed to hear it. And he said, Lord, I really need to hear from you as I'm going to open the Bible. I want to know what is... And his Bible reading for that day was literally the genealogies in the Old Testament. And he went, this is not what I want to read. Lord, I want something that tells me that you love me, that you want me. And as he read, he heard God say, your name is in this genealogy. You are a child of God. You are part of the family. So even what looks like a boring bit, when the Holy Spirit, you and I am in, he makes you realize you're part of that. So it's not boring. And now I'm going to say my last thing. We have talked at the beginning about what people, uh, 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 um, what famous historical characters have said about the Bible. I just want to turn to one last thing, what the Bible says about itself, really. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Turn with me, please. It says this, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, Joints and marrow, it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. And I'll finish it with 13 as well. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. 
Now that sounds gontem naturey to end on, but it's not. The point is that actually this book, that quite rightly people level at us that we treat, that we treat like it's just any old piece of literature, that we just neglect is actually, truly, as it says in Ephesians, it is a sword. And it can bring peace into this battle-torn planet. It can bring peace into your own situations. But it's not going to work if it's blunt. The only way it's sharp is if it's used and kept sharp by being kept open and dust-free. Swords get very rusty when they're not used that often. Word of the Lord is no different. So I want to get you excited. I want you to read about the talking donkey. I want you to talk about the, the legs of uh, sturdiness that sit on a base of gold. I want you to hear the rock music, because you should be into rock music. No, no. I want you to hear the rock music that's in the Bible. And there's other kind of music in there, is there and other genres as well. Read the word. Read the word. That table is going to be open again. Please go up there. There's some great commentaries. Uh, Tom Wright is a brilliant down-to-earth commentary uh, writer. If you want to get deeper about something you've never understood before, go and grab one of his books. Let's pray. Father, I do want to pray for each and every one of us here. We want to pray that we do actually get excited about your word. That we will wake up tomorrow morning, Tuesday morning, or we'll wake up or we'll be at home in the evening because we haven't got time in the morning, but we'll wake up and we'll do it in the evening. Lord, wherever, that we will get excited and want to read your word. Want to hear you speaking to us through it. Not to allow other things to cram in the way. <coughs> to clear off the remote controls from the top of it. And to realise that it is literally life. Life into our very selves and into our very society that need to hear it. Pray for that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, have a wonderful, blessed week. Please uh, um, go to the stall before you run out. Do have a look. See what's there. And other than that, have a fantastic week, I hope. God bless you. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.